Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the Redeemer, of whom Boaz had spoken, came by. So Boaz said, Turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one beside you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm a transaction one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Chilion and to Marlon. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Marlon, I have bought to be my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in, in Epaphratha and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife and he went into her and the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron, Hezron fathered Ram, Ram fathered Aminadab, Aminadab fathered Narshon, Narshon fathered Salmon, Salmon fathered Boaz, Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. So I'm just going to uh, stop sharing. I don't know whether you're sharing or not. You're doing PowerPoint, Alistair, but I'm going to hand over to you now. Um, and if you could just close in prayer at the end, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nice to be with you uh, again this morning um, and uh, to spend the time with you. And thank you for the welcome. Thank you for the chance to, to, to sing along as well. Really appreciate that. Uh, and then do the actions even better. So uh, thank you also for reading the chapter for us. And as we come to this last chapter of the book of Ruth, it's worth it just pausing just for 10 seconds and just reflecting where we've come from in order to understand where we're going to in this chapter. Of course, we remember that fundamentally the book of Ruth is a love story. And, and of course, we have, we have Ruth, who is poor. She's powerless. She's a widow. Um, but in chapter one, we discovered, and you sang it in the song, that she had, she had come to trust God, which is an important chapter for us. But we're introduced to Boaz in the second chapter, who is the, the man of wealth. And he has come to love Ruth. 
And so we have these two things that are brought together for us, that there is Ruth who has trusted God, but there is, and there is Boaz who loves Ruth, but faith and love are fundamentally not enough, we're going to discover. Because what actually needed to be, a, there needed to be a place where they could meet, a place where, where the, the great barrier that needed to be broken in order that Boaz's love for Ruth could be fully known and that, and that Ruth would discover all the provision that Boaz could make for her. And, and so there is a critical moment, which is what chapter four is all about, where his love for her could be fully expressed and her needs could be fully met. And it's in this act that happens for us in the beginning of the chapter when Boaz will step forward to be her redeemer. Redemption was important for her. And that, so not only then is it a, a book that is a love story, it's a book of real history. That's why the end of the chapter is so important. We're given that genealogy, long list of names. You wonder why they're all there. But of course, there's a name in there that rings a huge bell with us. David, David the king. So in other words, that this, this story is more than just a love story. If we discover it's, a, it's a, a story of real people, of God's real dealings with real individuals. And so I discover today, as we look at this chapter, as we think of the book, it's still about a God who has real dealings with real people, with real needs, as it exactly was back there in Ruth chapter four. For David the king is a real figure of history, as were all the other characters of the story. And so we discover it's the place where the love of God and the needs of humanity can properly meet. It's a place where God has intervened into real history to meet that need. And we can discover that together through the chapter to, uh, this afternoon. Now, we need to understand one last little thing before we, we launch into our chapter. In the, as we read all this and these people stood in the gate of the city and this discussion, taking your shoes off and handing them on. I mean, you know, and you think, what in all of the world is all that about? We need to just remember this, that there were two really important chapters right back early in the Old Testament that shed a great light on Ruth chapter four. They are the chapters in Leviticus chapter 25 and Deuteronomy chapter 25. And in those two chapters, we discovered this, that there was, there was procedure, if you like, there were rules about inheritance. And, and what happened when somebody sold the, their inheritance and it left their family and went over to another family. What could be done about it? There were rules about inheritance. There were also rules about one's progeny. Yeah, about, about actually what happened if somebody, somebody who died without any, any heirs, what happened then? And there were rules about that. And, and we discovered that what was needed was this, this, for somebody to step in and act both to preserve the inheritance, the land, and also to preserve the progeny, heirs. And Boaz is going to do exactly those two things in this chapter. Those two sets of rules, Leviticus 25 and Deuteronomy 25, are going to find themselves played out for us in this chapter. And we read right through that he was going to be a redeemer, a redeemer. He was going to pay price, pay a money in order that these things could be secured. And in particularly for our story, that Ruth and Naomi would have a secure future and that they would be brought into blessing, that they would be brought into a wonderful relationship. And more than that as well, that Boaz would be able to express his love for, in this case, Ruth in the story. And I think about that today and we think, how do I bring that back into our in our in our world today? I'm not suggesting any of us take out of our shoes this morning, but I tell you this. We need to find out the reality of the love of God towards us. And we need to be able to find how God can meet our need and give us a secure future, just as he did in the life of Ruth and Naomi in our chapter. And so that's why it's an important chapter. And so Boaz is going to become a redeemer, the man who will pay the price in order that these blessings might be known. And so instantly in our minds, I want you just to think, almost as it were, pick up, pick up a pair of binoculars, look through the lens to this story 
not through where we sit today for, for a moment, but think about Boaz as a picture, an illustration of a greater redeemer than he was. And that person is the Lord Jesus. And we use our chapter today to look through that lens and see the Lord Jesus and how he can be our redeemer, just as Boaz was Ruth's redeemer in the story that we read. So we're going to learn, first of all, there are seven great lessons that are here about redemption. I want to notice, number one, that what Boaz did, I'm going to call it was official. What I mean is this. We read that they went to the gate of the city. Why in the world did you go to the gate? Well, in, in Bible days, in Old Testament days particularly, the gate was where official business was transacted. It's where the court sat. It's where officialdom was. If something was going to be above board, by the rules, done proper, it was in the gate. And Boaz goes to the gate in order that this business would be transacted. It was official. It was going to meet all the requirements that were going to be set. There was never going to be a moment when someone could say, hang on a second, dodgy dealing. None of that. This was absolutely cut and dry. I want to tell you something. When I think about what the Lord Jesus has done in order to be our redeemer and the work that he did at the cross, can I tell you, it was utterly official. And that what I mean by that is this. It has met completely everything that God required. There's nothing left undone. There's nothing, something not quite right. No, no, no. When I think of what he has done, it is absolutely meets every requirement that there could possibly be. It was, for Boaz, official. But secondly, I want to notice this. It was open. It was public. It gathers together these 10 people uh, who come and sit with him, the witnesses to this transaction. He took the elders of the city. And, and together in that public sphere, this business is dealt with. You and I stand outside the city of Jerusalem just for a moment in our mind. I tell you, it, wasn't any, it couldn't have been any more public, could it, what the Lord Jesus did. The whole city saw it all. It was played out before them completely, so much so that we discover these words Paul wrote to, to Christians in, a, in the city of Galatia. And he said, before your eyes, he said, Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth crucified among you placarded like an advertisement that's the thought of the word evidently set forth utterly open and again again not only in his death was it open but in his resurrection the bible says equally openly wonderful words we read in colossians chapter 2 that the lord jesus in his resurrection he spoiled principalities and powers he made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it. Can I tell you that again, when we think of what the Lord Jesus has done, God has made a great public declaration of it. We can't hide from him. It's a fact. It's a reality. It's there. And we can rest and trust in it because of that. The third thing, there is a sense, though, it was done secretly. You say, how can it be open and secret at the same time? Well, you read through the first 10 verses of our chapter and Ruth's not there. She wasn't in the gate. She wasn't present. She doesn't see or hear any of this discussion. She just has to trust that it's happened. You and I were never there. We never stood outside the city of Jerusalem. We never heard Pilate pronounce and present the Lord Jesus to the crowd. We never stood at an empty tomb with those ladies on resurrection morning. We never saw it but it doesn't mean it never happened. It really did happen. Ruth knew it happened in the second half of the chapter because that's how she could be married to Boaz and blessed amazingly, but she never saw it. And you and I have never seen it, but it's still wonderful, it happened. And the cross of the Lord Jesus happened for you in order that you might be blessed amazingly. The third thing, the fourth thing I want us to notice is that we read together what motivated Boaz? We discovered that he first brings in verse number three, he talks about the, the portion of land. 
that was to be sold. And this other man who was, who was a nearer relative to Ruth, who could therefore potentially act as redeemer, he's interested in the land. Ah, I can increase the size of my garden. The land is good. But then Boaz drops the bombshell. He says, actually, it's about a person. It's Ruth. It's Ruth. So if you buy the land, you're also going to have to marry Ruth. And for that man, the land meant everything. The person meant nothing. But for Boaz, it was entirely the other way around. He, would be, he was happy to buy the land in order that also he could marry Ruth. And the person mattered most to him. Can I tell you that you matter to God? As a person, it's not what you have that matters to him. It's what you are. It's you. All that you are matters to him. There is a love for you that is irrespective of anything else that you have or don't have. And it's not whether you are great and famous or utterly unknown. He loves you. It's you that matter. Just as for Boaz, it was Ruth that mattered. The possessions, the land, frankly, I'm not so sure he was bothered about. But she was all that he wanted. And don't I tell you today, the Savior loves you in a way that's, well, it's unexplainable. Why should he love us? But he does. And you matter to him in the story. But I want to notice, please, this. And that number five, this great act of redemption we now get to the moment where there's this other man who has a claim. He's a nearer relative. He potentially could buy the land. But now he's been challenged. You're going to have to marry Ruth. And, and he says this. We read it together in verse number six. He says, I cannot redeem it for myself. Suddenly, it's not that he didn't have the money. He could have paid the price. It's what he was refusing to do was to bring Ruth to be his wife. He says, I cannot do it. This person was unable and unwilling to redeem. Unable and unwilling to redeem. And so Boaz was going to step in to do what others couldn't do. When it comes to getting right with God, I tell you, there are many people who will give a superficial way of, well, yeah, if you do this and do that, then surely, surely it will be okay in the end. And, 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 and they'll offer all sorts of remedies. But in reality, they're not able to deal with the fundamental question that you and I have. The how can we, who are at a distance from God, be brought back to him? Because in our story, we're reminded of something which we've probably not forgotten, but the story tells us it again in chapter four. She was Ruth the Moabitess. She was a foreigner. She belonged to a foreign land. She wasn't part of the people of Israel. She was at a distance from them. And if I go back into the, into the Old Testament, I discover this, that that distance was huge. I don't mean geographically, miles. What I mean is this. God had effectively said, if you're a Moabitess, it's going to be jolly hard work to get into the people of Israel. Ten generations are going to have to pass by. In other words, that distance was massive. And Boaz is saying this. He alone was prepared to bridge that gap and step in. I'm glad tonight, this afternoon, that there's a saviour who's bridged the biggest gap possible. The gap caused by our sin, who's reduced it to nothing, been able to bring us to God, bring us into relationship with himself. He, he has done all of that. He has done what others could not and would not do. And he has done it all. By going to that cross and dying and rising again. What an amazing saviour that he is. A great redeemer. So we've discovered that he overcame, says Boaz, the weakness, the failings of another. And then we get to this business of the shoes. Why the shoes? You may wonder what about it. Well, when we go back into Deuteronomy chapter 25, we discover that there were two things that went on. 
If a man refused to act as redeemer, two things would happen. Now, one of them happens in Ruth chapter four. And that is this, by taking off his shoe and handing it, in this case, to Boaz, he was essentially handing on the responsibility. And in the handing over that shoe, the transaction was complete. And Boaz would step in and act as redeemer. And so we might say this today, that this was appropriately witnessed. Now, if you were going to do some business transaction today, you'd end up with a whole pile of documents and you'd have to get them signed and then somebody else has to sign them and probably somebody else has to sign them and they're witnessed multiple times so that it is so that we establish that that transaction has been done properly. They did it here by the handing on of the shoe. Can I tell you this? God has witnessed the great transaction, not with shoes, or even signatures on pieces of paper. There's an empty tomb. It's still empty. Because Jesus Christ is risen again. And not only there's an empty tomb as God's sign, seal, witness to the wonder of what Christ has done. But the Lord Jesus is in heaven. He's seated in the th on the throne of God as witness to what God has done. I tell you. We can be absolutely certain today he can be your redeemer, just as it was true in that day. But there's a little twist that when we go back into Leviticus chapter, Deuteronomy rather, Deuteronomy chapter 25, that's hidden from us in Luke chapter four, in, in Ruth chapter four. I'll get my books and my Bible to write eventually. And, 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 and it's this. If somebody refused to be redeemer, then the person who was in desperate need could express their contempt of all of that. And they spat on them as a sign of their contempt. Now, you never get that in, chapter, in Ruth chapter 4. It's not there. Ruth's not present. She doesn't witness any of this. And so that is not there. But let me just tell you something just for a moment. I find it amazing. The Lord Jesus, he was willing to be redeemer. And yet, you know what? People still spat on him in contempt. We'll discover that when you read the Gospels. When he was there at his trial, they spat on him. He was willing to do what no one else could do. He was willing to be your redeemer. And they treated him with such contempt. He tells me this, that he must love us enormously. To have endured all of that in order to be your redeemer. But the last thing I discover of this is amazing. Is You might ask me today, well, how much did Boaz pay? How much did he pay? And the answer is, I don't know. The Bible never tells us. In fact, in fact, that price is never disclosed. And if I were to ask you today, what do you think? It really cost the Lord Jesus that you might be saved, that you might be forgiven, that you might be sure of a place in heaven. What really did it cost him? The answer is, I don't think you and I can ever, ever measure that. We'll never be able to put a figure to it. He was prepared to give everything. He gave himself, says the Bible. He prayed, he paid enormously. And the valley will never know. But aren't we glad today? I trust you're glad today that the Lord Jesus was prepared to pay that price in order that you might be redeemed. Those were the seven things that we learn of redemption. But our story doesn't end there. If that's the if that, if you like, is the process of redemption, which we get in verses one to ten in the second half of our chapter, we mustn't forget the the results, the fruit of redemption. What happens next? I want to notice three things just as we close. Number one, notice that the, the, the people in the gate of the city, they say to Boaz, when all this transactions is complete, we are witnesses. It's done. And then they go on to say this, the Lord make that woman which has come to your house like Rachel and, and Leah. And, and you are to do worthily in Ephrata to be famous in Bethlehem. Let your house be like the house of Pharaoh. In other words, 
Number one, Boaz was honoured. Boaz was honoured. Just stop for a moment. Perhaps it is that in your life's experience, there's come a moment when you trusted the Lord Jesus as saviour. That's amazing. We might just say quite rightly today, hallelujah, to know that the Lord Jesus is your saviour and you have trusted him. Let me tell you, the day you were saved, there was honour given to the Lord Jesus. The glory was his because he has acted as redeemer, as saviour, and it's his worth and fame that were to be proclaimed just as Boaz's were here, first of all. It was his worth and fame that was to be proclaimed. And we can borrow the language of the, of the New Testament. And think about what, what, uh, what John wrote in, in, in the book of Revelation. Thou art worthy, so it says of the Lord Jesus, you are worthy, for you have redeemed us. And he, to him is all the worth and the honour. And his house was to be built, it says Boaz. I don't mean literally four walls and a roof. The idea of a house is the family, the posterity, all that would come from that. Can I tell you the Lord Jesus is building a house? I will build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. And there is a moment coming when all of the all the all Christians will be gathered together when the Lord Jesus comes. And then we can use the language that is written in the Hebrew letter. He will say, I am the children that God has given me. And every last Christian together at that moment, every single one, what an amazing moment for his honor, his fame, his worth. But secondly, not only was Boaz honored, but Ruth was blessed and became a blessing. We discover that what it says in verse number 13, here's the real crux of the story, isn't it? If you like the, if you like the, the seven words, the eight words that summarize the entire book. So Boaz took Ruth and she was his wife. They got married. The love story found its final conclusion. Ruth and Boaz are brought together. But let me tell you what it tells, tells me is this, that she was brought into a permanent loving relationship with Boaz. And the other day that you and I trust the Lord Jesus, we are brought into a permanent loving relationship with him, linked with him forever, never to be broken. What an amazing thing. So close to him. But not only that, she became a blessing to others because they had a child and the child as the child was 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 put into the hands of Naomi, her mother in law, who became the, the, the nurse, the carer for the child. And and, and look at the, what they all say about it. Verses 14 and 15. The ladies of the town. Blessed be the Lord, which has not left you today without a redeemer. Yeah. And he will be to you a restorer of life, a nourisher of your old age. In other words, in that moment of salvation, not only was there blessing for Ruth, there was blessing for others. A restorer of life. No wonder the Bible talks about salvation as eternal life. We find an echo with it here, don't we? And not only that, but it talks about it as a, a nourisher of your old age. Let me tell you this. Salvation isn't just for the young. It's salvation that lasts right through the every moment and, and day of life, right to the far end and then to eternity. What an amazing thing. And so blessing that is brought. And we get that wonderful picture. Naomi took the child, laid it in her lap, became a nurse to her contentment that arose as a blessing of all of this. What an amazing thing salvation, redemption is that you and I can have today pictured in the story of Boaz and Ruth. But there's the last little bit. And Phil read that great long list of names. You wonder why there are these long genealogies recorded in the Bible. At least the one at the end of Ruth chapter four is quite short. But, and, and Phil read the list for us. I tell you this, in salvation, Ruth became part of something far greater. He said to Ruth, do you realize that Two or three generations from now, you, you are going to be the great grandma of the greatest king that Israel had. And I think Ruth would have looked at you and said, no idea what you're talking about. I'm just quite content to be the wife of Boaz. And she could see her own little life blessed 
but not realizing the greater purpose that God had, that he was going to bring David the king. And that's why the, the genealogy is given. Ruth is pivotal in this great moment of Israel's history. Have you ever thought that today, if you're not saved, that you could trust the Lord Jesus as Savior? That same act of faith that, that, that Ruth showed right back in chapter one, whose basis for it all was redemption, this work that Boaz would do on her behalf, and you can enter into blessing. Ever wondered what God's great purposes for you could be? And in that little life that you can live for him, there is great things that God can do. I wonder if you'd ever asked Ruth, how about David the king should have looked at you as if you were mad? But in the purpose of God, her life was going to be the basis of blessing for thousands more. Just think the impact if you were saved today and the life lived for him, what impact it could be far greater than you and I could perhaps ever imagine. That was the wonder of Ruth and Boaz. I hope that as we've looked at this chapter, not only might we be challenged by it and encouraged by it, but can I ask you, those that sat and listened to me today, whether you listen to this or listen to the and read the, the video again on a later date, can I ask you, are you saved? Are you redeemed? Have you trusted in what Christ has done? that you might be sure of the of blessing both now and for eternity, the forgiveness of sins and fellowship with God, brought into relationship with him. That's the wonder of the story that sits behind Boaz and Ruth. Shall we pray and just seek God's blessing?